their tongue, their body, and their actions. In August, we learn that a Christian's self-control will allow them to be patient or steadfast when enduring through hardships, even though we may not understand why we're suffering. In September, we discussed how this patience will cause Christians to live a godly life, fully in respect of God and His will. And finally, last month, we discussed how godliness will mean that Christians are kind towards others and will love their brethren. All that brings us to today's lesson in which we will be focusing on being a loving person. Now you might say, isn't that almost exactly the same as what we discussed last month? Well, in some regards, yes. But the love we're talking about today is not geared towards our brothers and sisters in Christ, but towards this world. If you recall last month, we did talk about being, in, being kind and loving towards the people in this world, in that in, in actuality, everyone is our brother since we're all human. However, the main focus of that sermon was to show that we're to especially love our brothers and sisters in Christ, we were determining, how can I show that love to my brother and sisters in Christ? It was brotherly kindness. Today we're going to show how that love for our brethren will lead us to be a loving people of all in this world. Now I thought the best way for us to show how we're to love this world is by examining how God loves this world and to pattern our love after His. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. This passage is by far the most famous verse in all the Bible. You see it plastered on billboards. You see it for some reason on posters at sporting events. Even people who know very little about the Bible most likely have heard of this verse. Yet do we really know what it means? On its face, it sounds simple enough. God sent Jesus to die for us because he loves us. While that is actually what the sentence says, until we realize the seriousness of sin, we really don't have a true appreciation for the love that God has for us. You see, Sin is not just a minor thing when it comes to God. 1 John 1 verse 5 tells us that God is light and in Him is no darkness, meaning that He will not accept us in sin. That is a frightening statement because I know I sin. I know I need God's forgiveness and grace in order to be saved. And so does each person listening today who is old enough to be accountable before God. To show us just how serious sin is, let's turn to the book of Romans. We're going to spend a lot of time in Romans chapter 5. Right now we're going to read verses uh, 12 through 14. Romans 5, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, 
And so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. In this chapter, Paul is showing that both Jews and Gentiles are justified in Christ and not through the works of the law of Moses. He refers back to an event that would be very familiar to the Jews. The first sin committed by Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, a tree that God told them not to eat of, they sinned resulting in sin and death entering this world. Before that time, we do not read of death at all, either physical or spiritual. However, when they ate, they immediately died spiritually before God, as was evident by the shame that they felt and the fact that they hid themselves from God when he approached them. But physical death also entered this world then, for God took away access to the tree of life, meaning that man would no longer live forever on this earth. In addition to death, sin entered into this world. If you recall, Genesis 1.31 says that when God finished his creation, he looked on it and behold, it was very good. That means that there was no sin to corrupt it. That all changed when Adam and Eve sinned. Even though Adam and Eve felt ashamed for sinning, though, they gained the knowledge that sin could also be pleasurable to the flesh. Before that time, they had no sinful desires. There was no knowledge about that at all. Righteousness and union with God was all that they had experienced. All that changed as well when the first sin was committed. Once sin entered into this world, mankind has been drawn to it as the easy way to solve our problems. Don't have something that you want? Instead of earning the money to try to purchase it, steal it. Someone bothering you? Instead of working out your differences and talking to one another, you can hurt them, or in extreme cases, kill them. Sin, through the working of the devil, couldn't rule this world until Adam and Eve allowed it to get a foothold here by disobeying God in the first place. But contrary to what Calvinists may say, Romans 5 does not teach that all are sinners because Adam sinned. Romans 5.12 says that we are sinners because we sin. Yes, we suffer the consequences of Adam's sin in that we are born into a sinful world and we will die physically. But we don't suffer spiritual death until we sin. In fact, if you believe that this passage teaches that all are universally made sinners because of Adam's sin, you must also believe that everyone is made universally righteous because Jesus died on the cross. Listen to Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many were made righteous. If Calvinism is right, and everyone is made a sinner because Adam had sinned, then everyone is made righteous because of Christ. Now, of course, we know such an interpretation would contradict other passages of Scripture. In Hebrews 5, verse 9, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. Obedience is required in order to receive salvation. Something that can only be obtained by having our sins forgiven. All this teaches us an important lesson when it comes to interpreting scripture. If we believe a doctrine to be true, but it directly contradicts other passages in scripture, it's not the scripture that is wrong. It is our doctrine that is wrong and is therefore something we need to stop believing in. So what is Romans 5.19 saying? By one man, Adam, sin and death entered into this world and because of that, 
Sin's influence caused people to follow after Adam in sinning and be lost in sin. So also by one man, Jesus, righteousness and life entered into this world. And because of that, righteousness's influence caused people to follow after Jesus and be saved in Christ. That's what the verse is talking about. Sin entered by Adam, righteousness entered by Christ. It's not teaching anything about being born in sin. Having now dealt with the destructive nature of sin, let's turn now to God's outpouring of love that he had for us. Let's step back to Romans, or in Romans 5, and read verses 6 through 11. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. As we said earlier, God is light. He accepts no sin. He could have easily destroyed us all like he did in the days of, Mo in the days of Noah, except for those eight righteous souls. But he didn't do that. He loved us so much that he decided to send Jesus. This plan was made before mankind ever sinned, but was first prophesied to us after the fall. In Genesis 3.15 we read, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This is God telling Eve that through her seed, God would send the Savior to crush the head of the serpent, which is the devil. This seed could have been anyone, but ultimately we know it was narrowed down to Abraham. In Genesis 12, verse 3, we read, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It would be through the seed of Abraham that the Messiah would come. As we know, this, again, could have been any of the seed of Abraham. It could have been Ishmael or Isaac, but God selected Isaac. It could have been Esau or Jacob, but God selected Jacob. It could have been through any one of Jacob's children, but God selected Judah. And for the next 400 to 600 years after that, God didn't announce any further narrowing of the family through whom the Messiah would come. That is, until David came along. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 16, we read, And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Doesn't sound like a messianic prophecy there, but if you turn to Acts 2, you can know that God was speaking of Jesus here because that's what Peter said he was speaking of. He was speaking of Jesus. Just think about what God did for us. In spite of giving us free will, he brought about all of history to save us. That's how powerful God is. That not one choice that we made had the ability to thwart God's redemption plan. That's the kind of love he had for us. That he was willing to do all of that while we sinned against him and cursed his name. And he continues to show that love in that this earth still stands, allowing more people to obey him. 2 Peter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God doesn't want to cast a single person to hell. He wants everyone to repent and be with him forever in heaven. Now let's not take that to mean that he won't cast people to hell, for we know that he will. But that's not his desire. There's not one person, no matter what we've done, that God is not willing to save if we will repent. By sinning, we dug the hole for our own grave, a hole so deep 
that we can't climb out of it on our own. But because God loved us and wanted to save us, He sent Jesus into the hole to dig us an escape route. And if we choose to follow Him, we can escape this hole and inherit eternal life. So seeing as how God loved each and every one of us that He sent Jesus, we should not only love our brothers, but we should love the people in this world too. The question is, how do we show that love? Well, the first thing we can do is we can pray for this world. In the Sermon on the Mount, found in Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, listen to Jesus' words that are contained in chapter 5, verses 43 and 48. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be the sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus says it's easy to love our friends. And that's so true. For it doesn't take much effort for me to love Henry. Because Henry has never done one thing in the three plus years I've known him that has been mean or vindictive towards me. He treated me like a brother in Christ. And so has each and every one here today. Yet with the people on the internet that have called me a fool for believing the Bible... It's much harder for me to love them. But Jesus said I'm to love them. In this passage, Jesus told us to pray for those who persecute us. The question is, how do we pray for them? Or what do we pray? Well, for starters, we can pray that they stop persecuting us. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Nobody likes to be persecuted. So it is not wrong to ask God to alleviate some of our struggles. Remember always that persecution will come to those who live as a Christian. But I suggest that Jesus' prayers, or Jesus' words here, was telling us that our prayer should go even farther than that. Not only are we to pray that they stop persecuting us, but we're to pray that their hearts might become receptive to the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. For someone to produce faith, they must first hear the word of God. This hearing, however, is not just physically listening to it, but listening with a receptive heart. The Word of God is powerful enough to produce two results, acceptance or rejection. The difference between those two results is the condition of the person's heart. Some people's hearts are so hardened against God that we can preach to them until we're blue in the face and they won't obey, while others can hear the gospel message at one time and obey it right then and there. Praying that a person's heart be receptive to the gospel is something that we can pray for, leaving the how that happens up to God. And lastly, we can pray for time. In 2 Peter 3, we already read verses no, verse 9, but now we're going to add verse 10. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. This earth still exists today because God's patience has not run out. The more time exists, the longer people have to obey. Praying for time for the lost to hear the gospel is also therefore not wrong. But in so doing, let's make sure that we use our time wisely in spreading the message. Let's not just pray for time and, and just hope that someone will hear. 
let's go out and use that time we've prayed for to teach. So praying for this world is one way we can show our love. Another way we can show our love is by being good to the world. Paul says in Romans 12, 19 and 21, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Vengeance is not mine to take. I'm to leave that to God. That means if someone robs me, I'm not to rob them back. If someone kills my loved one, I'm not to kill them in return. Now that, of course, is going to bring up a question on self-defense. A few weeks ago, I made a point in a sermon about needing to be willing to die for Christ. As an example, I used if someone walked through that door at the back and began shooting people simply because they claimed to be Christians, would we be willing to die? How was I to know that at that very moment, and it was at that very moment, a mad gunman was committing that very atrocity in a Baptist church in Texas? In the aftermath of that shooting, the question about Christians carrying guns in order to prevent such massacres has come to the forefront. And while we are not a heavily gun-owning society, it's still whether or not we should carry whatever weapon we want, uh, whether it's a knife uh, meant for killing, not, not just meant for kills. <coughs> whatever weapon it is, should we carry a weapon like that? While emotions can run high in such a discussion, we must always turn to what the Bible says. Now, while the scriptures do not teach that self-defense as in and of itself is wrong, for Ephesians 5, 25 to 33, tells husbands to love their wives and protect them, and Paul used various means to protect himself from death in the book of Acts, the fact remains that just because the scriptures don't condemn self-defense doesn't mean that all forms of self-defense are approved by God. Does God ever tell me as an individual that my goal should be to kill my attacker? No. When Jesus needed to escape the crowds, what did he do? Did he pull a sword? No. He found an escape route. The same with Paul and the other apostles. Our goal in defending ourselves or others should be either to escape the attack or subdue the attacker, not to kill the attacker. Now yes, sometimes in the act of defending oneself, an attacker might die as a result. But that should be the exception, <coughs> not the rule. Jesus told us in Matthew 10, 28, not to be afraid of the one who can kill the body. Be afraid of the one who can kill the soul. Even though we're allowed to protect ourselves by actively seeking to kill our attacker, we're closing the door on their salvation. How is that loving that person? What are we to do instead? We're to do good to others. This is by leading by example. When others wrong us, do good to them right back. Jesus forgave his murderers while hanging on the cross. Stephen forgave his killers while being stoned. Certainly we can forgive those who wrong us. If we're known around our community as those who practice good to everyone, the greater the chance we'll be able to show the final act of love that we'll discuss this morning, which is preaching to those lost in sin. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Name for me one person on this planet who is unworthy of hearing the gospel. Is our neighbor next door unworthy? What about one of our co-workers who's rather nasty to us? Is Paul Bernardo a savage rapist and killer? 
who's housed in jail up in, I think, Kingston. Is he unworthy? What about Donald Trump? A man that some believe has done despicable things when it comes to his treatment of women. And the answer to that is no, they are not unworthy. There is nothing that these people have done that would justify us not teaching the gospel to them if we had the chance. In his journeys, Paul went to everyone, both Jews and Gentiles. We got one of those examples in Acts 13. If you want to turn there, we're going to read Acts 13, 44 to 49. Acts 13, beginning at verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken first to you. Since you thrust it aside and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord, and as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region. In this context, Paul is in Antioch of Pisidia, which is in modern-day Turkey. As was his custom, he first went and taught the Jews, people who should have been looking for the Messiah. And after this, he would go and teach the Gentiles. And even though the Jews, on the whole, had rejected Christ in almost all of Paul's journeys, on the whole, there were some who obeyed, but on the whole, when Paul went to a city, he didn't say they're unworthy. They were still worthy of hearing the gospel. Note in this passage who declared themselves unworthy. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't God. It was the unbelievers themselves. If people refuse to hear and obey the gospel, they have declared themselves unworthy of eternal life. And if that ends up being the case, we should take the message to others who are willing to hear. But the determination of worthiness or unworthiness doesn't lie with us. For we're to go out and teach everyone. What someone does with that message is entirely up to them. So in conclusion, a person who loves this world will pray that this world would have receptive hearts to the Word of God, will do good to the people in this world, even when confronted with evil, and will preach to everyone, no matter what type of person they are. All of this brings us back to our original question, the one that I asked at the first sermon in April. I'll bet you you don't remember what it is. If you were asked, what are some common indicators or marks of a Christian, what answer would you give? Now you know now what to say. A Christian is faithful. A Christian is virtuous. A Christian is knowledgeable in God's word. A Christian is self-controlled. A Christian is patient or steadfast. A Christian is godly. A Christian is kind to their brethren. And a Christian is loving towards those who are lost in this world. Now, lest you think I pulled these marks out of thin air to make this an eight-part series, you can rest assured that I didn't. Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. It's the passage we have been avoiding in each and every one of these sermons. Let's read verses 3 to 12. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us to his glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and great promises, so that through them you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, 
and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to make your calling and election sure, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend to remind you of these qualities, though you know them, and are established in the truth that you have. When we become a Christian, we start out with faith. But our journey doesn't end with faith. It grows, or it is to grow. If we don't have faith, we won't have the courage to stand for Christ and for what is right. If we don't have courage, we won't seek to obtain the knowledge about sin and righteousness. If we don't have knowledge about sin and righteousness, we will never learn how to control ourselves and keep ourselves out of sin. If we don't have self-control, we'll never be able to be patient or steadfast to endure through hardships, but we'll curse God and abandon Him. If we don't have patience and steadfastness, we will not be able to live a godly life with a deep respect for God and His Word. If we don't have godliness, we will be unable to truly love our brethren, for we won't listen to God's instructions. And if we don't have brotherly kindness, we won't love this world, for if we can't love those who love us, how can we love those who hate us? Now when we begin our lives as a Christian, we may be strong in some points, but weak in others. But through the study of God's word, we will grow in grace and knowledge. And these traits will abound in us. If we don't grow in these traits, Peter says that we are blind and have forgotten Christ. In that condition, our soul is in danger. However, if we practice these traits, Peter says we will never fall. For they will perfect us in Christ and secure our salvation. Will we sin? Yes. But one who practices these traits will repent of their sins and ask God, for forgiveness. Let's grow in these traits as we continue our walk with Christ, thus making our calling an election shoot unto the day of judgment. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to 